Our chapel speaker today is Dr. Bob Boyd. He's an international evangelist and president of the Bob Boyd Evangelical or Evangelistic Association. Bob is a graduate of the College of William and Mary in Virginia, Dallas Theological Seminary with a THM in 1983, and a DMIN from Asbury Seminary. Dr. Boyd has spoken to thousands of people on university campuses, in evangelistic crusades, and on radio and television around the world. And as a result, many people have put their faith and trust in Christ as their Savior and have become active disciples of Jesus Christ. Bob and his wife, Mallory, live in Norfolk, Virginia. They have four sons, uh, which I refer to as the Blessed Bees, Bobby, Benjamin, Billy, and Brian. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Dr. Bob Boyd. Thank you. It is great to be back here at Dallas. I'm a little biased, but I believe I got the best biblical education available in the world when I was here. Many, some of it from some of these gentlemen up front, and I am very grateful. Our subject this morning is how you can have the power of God. Some years ago, I was attending a large Jewish wedding and they got to the end of the ceremony to the part where the bridegroom stamps on a glass wrapped in a napkin. Maybe you've seen it in the movies. He goes, wham! And everybody cheers and screams. And it's a big celebration. And just before the bridegroom stamped on the glass, the rabbi began to explain what he believed was the meaning of the ceremony. I thought it was fascinating. He said, in a moment, the bridegroom is going to stamp on this glass, and the glass represents happiness or fulfillment. He's going to shatter it into thousands of pieces, and he said, that's a lot like life. I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. He said, you see, we go through life, and we have a success here or an achievement there, and it's like picking up pieces of the broken glass in trying to reassemble the glass of happiness. And he said, no one ever gets the whole glass, but basically we spend our life picking up the pieces. And as he talked, I thought to myself, what a tragic view of life. I mean, that night when I was a senior at the College of William and Mary and cried out to God and Jesus Christ burst into my life and filled me with his love and power, I got the whole glass. I mean, I got complete fulfillment in him. And even though it was a big Jewish wedding, I could hardly keep from leaping to my feet and shouting, I've got the whole glass. But somehow I didn't think they would appreciate it. You know, they were dressed to kill. And they would have killed me instead. But men and women, it is true. You and I have the whole glass. Sometimes in the busyness of all the assignments, and getting ready to do all the papers and all the work that you're assigned, it's easy to lose sight while you're here of the fact that you have the secret of life that the world is looking for. Do you know that when you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, you receive the one, the Holy Spirit, who raised Christ from the dead? You have living inside of you the one who spoke a word, and the vast galaxies of space leaped into being. You have living inside of you one who is more powerful than all the nuclear weapons on earth. And so I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you feel the power? Are you experiencing the power of God in your life? The National Football League had a slogan some years ago. It was, feel the power. And that is my question for you this morning. Are you experiencing the tremendous power that God has invested in you when he came into your heart? Because I would like to share with you how you can experience the power of God this morning. Obviously, 
unconfessed sin can block the power of God. And we want to confess our sins and come and surrender our life. As we sang a moment ago, I surrender all. This is part of experiencing His power. But I would like to share a great secret key for experiencing God's power that so many of us do not, do not use. And it is one of the keys, one of the most important keys in the entire Bible for experiencing God's supernatural power. And it is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. <laughs> now you're saying, I cannot believe that anybody would have the chutzpah, the gall, to come to Dallas Seminary and speak on Acts 1.8. <laughs> I mean, we are the world's experts in Acts 1.8. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know Acts 1.8 backwards and forwards and sideways, and you've got at least 50 or maybe 100 observations <laughs> on Acts 1.8. So how could I possibly come and have something new to say to you on this great verse? Well, I want to tell you that ever since I graduated, THM 83, <laughs> that God has been teaching me every year, practically every day, about the power of the promise in Acts 1.8. And I've been learning new things. And I want to share with you just one great principle which will change your life out of Acts 1.8. <laughs> As you know, this great promise, which you've all memorized, <laughs> is, comes in two parts. There is a promise of power and there is a great mission. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's the promise of power. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, in other words, starting where you are, and then in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. I won't insult you by going into the details of the verse. <laughs> but God has promised us supernatural power in this verse. As you all know so well, in the next chapter on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down upon and filled those who had received Christ. And ever since then, those of us who have received the Lord Jesus Christ have this power already in our lives. Then why are we not experiencing it more? As I travel around the world and have had the opportunity to speak to hundreds of thousands of people and via mass media to millions of people, I've discovered that many times Christians, the vast majority, are not experiencing the power of God as they long to. And so the one secret I want to share with you from this verse is simply this. God has promised us His power not to do our will. Ladies and gentlemen, God has promised us His power to do His will. His will is that we be His witnesses. What does that mean? Well, I think you could describe it very well, but you know, being a witness, it means to testify about what you have seen and heard to those who have not seen and heard. Being a witness does not mean primarily teaching the Bible to believers, though that is crucial. Being a witness bring, means bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to lost people primarily around the world. And when we are witnesses for Christ, telling others who have not experienced Him what we have experienced, that is when we see His power. My friends, God has promised us His power to share His love with the lost world. And you know, when we step out of our comfort zone and do that, we see supernatural things happen. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of of God. I remember when I graduated from Dallas, I was very involved in, uh, in different ministries here and in student government, and I was ready to take on the world. I thought, man, just unleash me, you know, let me share all this stuff I've learned. And God thought it was better that I go to a little bitty country church on the original Walton's Mountain of TV fame. Um, this is not a place like Walton's Mountain, if you ever saw that movie. This was the original Walton's Mountain in Virginia. And I went and I was all full of fire and I arrived at a little bitty country church like some of you will do. And I thought, man, I got all this stuff to share. Okay, let's preach it. And then I was preaching and teaching and people in my audience were like really interested, you know, like <laughs> they were nodding off, you know, I thought, man, this just isn't changing the lives like I want it to. And I began to pray, God, somehow use me. And 
And one day we invited the leader of the youth program over to our house. Her name was Liz. And I said, Liz, you know, the greatest thing that we can give our youth is the gift of eternal life. And she said, I, I think that's right. And I said, but Liz, you cannot give what you do not have. And, and, and Liz, unless we have eternal life, we can't give it to other people. The Bible says you must be born again to have eternal life. Let me ask you something, Liz. Have you been born again? And she said, no, I haven't. And I said, well, would you like to be? And she said, yes, I would, but I can't. I hadn't heard that answer quite a lot. So I said, well, what do you mean? She said, there's someone I can't forgive. I thought that's very perceptive. If you can't forgive somebody, you know, you can't really receive Christ. And uh, so I said, well, this will be pretty easy. I mean, just forgive him. I said, well, well tell me about it. <laughs> She began to tell me the story. And when you're a pastor, you find out things about people that you never learn any other way. And, I mean, her mother-in-law uh, was, well, let's put it this way. Her husband was sexually perverted. And part of his sexual perversion was that he thought that his sister was really his sister, but his sister was really his mother. And his mother-in-law had lied to him about this whole thing, and he was so sexually mixed up that he was in trouble with the law. And I mean, it was like some kind of nightmare. And as she described her mother-in-law and how she had covered this whole thing up and how she had ruined her son's life and was ruining Liz's marriage. And I thought, man, you know, no wonder you're mad at this lady. You know, cream her. And I thought, well, that's not the way a pastor is supposed to react, you know. So I said, as she described this, I finally said, Liz, this is horrible. I mean, I've never heard anything like this. Your mother-in-law is destroying your life. I said, you're right, you can't forgive her. And she looked at me like, you know, that's not what the pastor is supposed to say. I said, Liz, you can't forgive your mother-in-law. But Jesus Christ can. And he can give you the power to do what you can't do. And she said, it's like something clicked. She said, you, you mean he'll give me the power to do it? And I said, yes, he will. She knelt down on the floor with my wife and I, I'll never forget, in the little parsonage on Walton's Mountain. And Liz began to pray. And a little tear came down her cheek. And then not just a tear, she began to weep. And then she began to sob. And then she began to heave with sobs. And she said, oh God, God, give me the grace to do what I can't do. Give me the grace to forgive my mother-in-law. I forgive her. And when she looked up, there was a radiance on her face. And my wife, Mallory, and I were looking at a new human being. It was incredible. She threw her arms around us. She hugged us. She kissed us. You know, I mean, she, she was, I mean, she was a different person. She went on to lead her mother to Christ. She went on to lead her sister to Christ. To witness to her brother to bring him to Christ. And then her dad was the crankiest, meanest, most ornery person I'd ever met. I mean, you go as his pastor to visit him in the hospital and say, hey, pastor, you blankety-blank son of a... I mean, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Liz loved her dad. And two months before he died of cancer, she brought him into the kingdom of God. We'll see him in eternity because Liz reached every single member of her family for Christ. And we began to disciple her and tell her how she could reach other people. And it was the beginning of a revival in her family which spread to Walton's Mountain. And one by one, people began to come to Christ and they began to come to our church and our church began to grow and explode because of the power of the gospel. And men and women, when you begin to see what God can do when you step out of your comfort zone and go to unbelievers with the gospel, it's just, it's mind-boggling. And we began to get a vision we said, well, you know, we'd love to go to a bigger church. And we were invited to do that. But we thought, we want to do a ministry bigger than we can do in a local church. And, and God, would you open the door to do evangelism? And through a series of divine interventions, Campus Crusade for Christ invited us to come on staff in the unique role of a national speaker. There were 3,000 staff and about eight national speakers. And everyone else had spent 20 years getting there, going up through the ranks. And somehow they invited us on to come on and speak which was really a miracle because people were still going to sleep when I preached in church. <laughs> but uh, So we came on with the Campus Crusade and it, it was wonderful to go to campuses and begin to see, you know, 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, 200 people 
in a week come to Jesus Christ and surrender their lives to Him. It was wonderful. And you know, God always knows how to make you know that it's Him. I remember we came back here after a number of years with Campus Crusade for a preaching evaluation. And uh, Bill Lawrence and Roger Raymer were, inter- were, were examining this tape of my preaching to a crowd of uh, people who filled a basketball arena at University of Wisconsin. And after they listened to the tape, they said, listen, Bob, here's some things you could do different, you know. And they told me all these things that needed to be changed and needed to be improved. And I was thinking, I was feeling lower and lower and lower, you know. <laughs> and finally they said, are you saying that 77 people came to Christ in that one meeting? And I said, well, yes. And they looked at each other and they shook their heads like, that was a miracle, you know, because it wasn't a very good message. <laughs> and then they turned around to my wife. And my wife had a little tape that she had given them of teaching. And they said, Mallory, we want to evaluate your teaching now. I said, okay, it's her turn. They said, Mallory, you are an outstanding teacher. I mean, you are so gifted. You're incredible. I mean, why don't you use your skills more often? And they went on and on about how wonderful she was. You know, and finally, when they were through, we took a little walk. And Mallory said, what do you think of that evaluation? I said, I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) My little male ego was absolutely crushed. (laughs) But it just shows that God doesn't use us because of our ability. He says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And when we share the gospel, there is a power that is beyond us. You know, God began to give us a vision, not just for America, but for the world. We had seen thousands of students across the United States come to Christ. And that was wonderful. But then he opened the door to begin to do international campaigns. And we went. And I'll never forget, our first campaign was in Pakistan. Uh, right in the heart of Taliban country where 98% of the population belonged to the Taliban's tribe. It was incredible to see people come forward. And then, and then I wish I had time to talk about it, but then we went to, to India and then we went to Africa and God did something wonderful. You know, God's plans are better than our plans. But when we go, men and women, and we proclaim the gospel to people, there is power. In Africa, we had 100 churches come together and then we would have... 10,000 people come a night and hear the gospel and people would stream forward by the hundreds to come to Christ. It was just beautiful. I'd like to show you a video of a little bit what it was like in, um, in one of the countries where we visited in Africa. God has given us a passion for reaching people around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the world is an incredibly needy place, but we found nowhere more needy than Africa. It's not so much just a call to Africa, but it's a call to ministry and to minister wherever the open door is, wherever we feel like God is leading us. And we've ministered in several different countries, and it seems like we've come back to Africa, this is our third summer because God is doing such a mighty work here that we wanted to be part of it. I've just been overwhelmed with the number of children we've spoken to. Um, I expected, you know, schools of maybe 500, but that that was a small school, 500, and every other school was over 1,000. And the the children are just wide-eyed and eager to listen, to hear what we have to say. They're responding to the gospel. I think their their hearts are being changed. We had heard for years the the numbers of people that have been reached for Christ. And now we have a chance to firsthand experience uh, those numbers. It's not unusual to have a crowd of seven to 10,000 people or more uh, in one service. And to just look out and see that sea of faces and to know that his ministry is touching their lives has been very impressive to me. As I said, God's plans are always better than ours. 
When we came back from Africa, we always follow up everyone individually who's come to Christ because we want to make disciples, not converts. We thought the adults would be the main thing. But wonderfully, a school of discipleship began with children. They had 200, those 200 became 400, became 800, 1,000, 3,000. There are now 7,000 children, all new believers in discipleship. And a revival is happening in western Kenya because of the power of the gospel. But my friends, when I consider what Jesus Christ did for us, let me ask you, is there anything we wouldn't do for him? Some years ago, I had a young friend named Frank Pace, who was an outstanding athlete and a friend. And Frank was canoeing on the river one day with his brother Clay, and they capsized in the canoe. Those of you who have gone boating know that you're supposed to stick with your boat until someone comes. Well, no one was on the river and it grew dark and soon they could tell they were not going to, they were going to, they were at night and they were hypothermic. They knew they would not make it through the night. So they decided they had to strike out for shore. So Frank and his brother began to swim. After a few strokes, my friend could tell that his brother was not going to make it. So he slowed up. And like a swimming cheerleader, he said, come on, you can do it, Clay, you can do it. And they swam stroke by stroke closer to shore. Finally, Clay staggered up on the little beach, totally out of bed. <laughs> but my friend Frank disappeared beneath the surface of the water, 20 feet from shore. They found my friend's body a mile downstream a week later. My friend Frank loved his brother so much that at the age of 16, he was willing to give up his life so his brother would live. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ has done for you and me. On the cross, he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in a way that we cannot possibly understand, Jesus Christ went to hell on the cross because that's what hell is, separation from God. And he burned in the agony of hell so that you and I would never have to go to hell. And if Jesus Christ would do that for you and me, my friends, is there anything we would not do for him? There was a man being led to execution in England and he, he saw the preacher on the street corner. And he said, if I believed what you do about heaven and hell, I would crawl on my hands and knees on broken glass across England to tell people. Wouldn't we? Is there anything we wouldn't do to bring the gospel to people who are headed for an eternity in hell? Billy Graham said that the greatest single act of love that we could ever show someone is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Some years ago, we had a nursing home ministry and we, would, we started with three or four and then we had 10 and 20 and we visited people in the nursing home, some of them dying without Christ. And one day, a friend called me. She was in a, a superintendent at the nursing home and she said, Bob, there's a man here named Mr. Von Stein and I want you to know he doesn't know the Lord. Not only that, he is dying. He could die at any moment. And he is in a coma. I thought, this sounds pretty bad. <laughs> Not only is that, but he, he, he cannot respond to anyone. He cannot hear you. He cannot respond. He can't see anybody. He is cut off from the world, and the doctors give him no hope. And he is about to step over the edge. I just thought you'd like to know. And I thought to myself, thanks a lot. <laughs> but I said, well, thank you, you know, and I hung up the phone. I thought, what can I do? But at least I can try. So I went down to the nursing home, and there lay Mr. Von Stein, and I walked in the room, and I thought, you know, in a situation like this, you can afford to be bold. So I walked over to Mr. Von Stein, I leaned over, and I shouted into his ear, basically. I said, Mr. Von Stein, I said, you are going to die. I'm sure the nurses really appreciated this. <laughs> I said, Mr. Von Stein, if you die right now, you are going to go to hell. I said, Mr. Von Stein, Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you. And he rose from the dead for you. And I explained the gospel. I said, Mr. Von Stein, he's still just lying there like a plank, you know. I said, Mr. Von Stein, if you hear what I'm saying somehow and you want to receive Jesus Christ, then I would like you to 
to raise your hand and put it over your chest. And his hand came up. I thought, this is great. This is wonderful. This is fantastic. This is, well, you never know. I mean, he had been actually, you know, a little bit spastic, flinching and twitching now and then. I thought, well, maybe that's just another twitch, you know. <laughs> so I got on my knees and I prayed and I said, God, help me. I, I said, then I got off my knees. I said, Mr. Von Stein, I'm going to ask you a second time. If you really want to receive Christ into your heart, then, then I want you to raise your other hand and put it on your chest. And sure enough, his other hand came up. I thought, this is great. This is wonderful. This is fantastic. This is, uh, I don't know, you know. I mean, oh, ye of little faith, right? <laughs> Maybe you just shout in his ear and it's just a reflex reaction, you know. His hand comes up. But then finally I said, got on my knees. I said, God, I can't believe. I don't know what to do. Give me a sign. You're not supposed to ask for those, right? But <laughs> all of a sudden it came into my mind. He had never made any kind of coordinated movement really at all. And so I, I said, Mr. Bonstein, I'm going to ask you one last time. <laughs> if you really want to receive Christ into your life, his hands were down by his side. I said, I'd like you to raise your hands and put them over your chest, over your heart, and hold them there. And by doing that, you're confessing you want Jesus Christ to come into your heart. I, I want you to do that, and I want you to do that right now. And there was nothing. Nothing. And then... His hands came over his heart and they stayed there. And I prayed with Mr. Von Stein. And I left rejoicing. I thought, this is wonderful. The next morning I called my friend. I said, how is Mr. Von Stein? She said, he's gone. And I thought to myself, he's in heaven for eternity because God can even use someone as weak and as sinful as me to preach the word. My friends, when you get between the love of God and the hurt of the world, and allow God's love to flow you through the, to the hurting world, through you to the hurting world, you will see God's power. Jesus Christ is the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word.